welcome to the show. Find your balance. 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 Find your balance. That is our goal here at Boost Health. Welcome to episode number 57 of the Boost Health podcast. I'm super excited to launch this episode with special guest, Dr. David Minkoff. I think everyone's going to learn a lot in this episode and take away actionable steps no matter what type of diet you're on. We dig deep on the topic of protein and we discuss why most of his patients are low in at least one essential amino acid. We talk about his thoughts on plant-based nutrition, the difference between protein digestion and protein utilization, the problem with whey protein, the problems with the Impossible Burger, how to properly detox, fasting, alcohol, CBD, and so much more. It's a great episode. One quick announcement and we'll jump right into the show. I recently set up a Patreon page for those of you that want to help support Boost Health. As most of you know, this podcast and video cast is a way for me to share wellness strategies. I dig deep into the research on any given topic, and occasionally I have guests on the show to share their expertise. The show does require a lot of time and effort on my part, and there's also some financial obligations with bandwidth and equipment and sometimes travel. If you find value in the show and you think it's worthy of your financial contribution, I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'll link to the uh, Patreon page in the blog and show notes if you're interested in helping out. All right, now here's episode 57, the best protein source, myths, digestion versus utilization, and essential amino acids. My guest on episode 57 of the Boost Health podcast is Dr. David Minkoff. Now, I'm a big fan of David's. I heard him on Ben Greenfield's podcast several times. Um, And I've been taking essential amino acids for a long time based on recommendations that both he and Ben made. And for those that aren't familiar with Dr. Minkoff, here is a little background on him. Dr. David Minkoff graduated from the University of Wisconsin Medical School in 1974. He was inducted into the Alpha Omega Alpha Medical Fraternity with high academic honors. He is board certified in pediatrics, completed a fellowship in infectious diseases, and served as co-director of the neonatal intensive care unit at Palomar Medical Center in San Diego, California. And Dr. Minkoff has extensive postgraduate training in complementary and alternative medicine, and he co-founded LifeWorks Wellness Center in 1997 with his wife, Sue. In the year 2000, he co-founded Body Health, which is a nutrition company that offers a unique range of dietary supplements to the public and practitioners, including a breakthrough product that utilizes over 99% protein synthesis called Perfect Amino, which we'll mention a lot today. Now, Dr. Minkoff is also very passionate about wellness and fitness. He's a 42-time Ironman finisher, which just boggles my mind. It's amazing. And he continues to train on a regular basis. And he and his wife reside in Clearwater, Florida. And he's also the author of an awesome new book that I just read. It's called The Search for the Perfect Protein, The Key to Solving Weight Loss, Depression, Fatigue, Insomnia, and Osteoporosis. And I noticed it actually has a perfect uh, five-star rating on, on Amazon, which I would definitely agree with. So, David, thank you so much for joining the show today. I really appreciate it. Fun to talk to you, Paul, and I'm really looking forward to it. I've got lots of questions for you today, so I'm going to just jump right in. Uh, as I mentioned, I've really, really enjoyed your book. I was super interested in it um, because I'm very interested in protein, especially as a vegan. So I'm always trying to make sure that I'm getting everything that I need uh, as, as a special nutrition needs person, I guess you could say. And so your book was uh, sort of an in-depth exploration on protein, amino acids, and sort of what the perfect protein is and sort of the, the myths around protein, as we'll talk about, there's a lot of, of myths about our beliefs about protein, at least in the mainstream. So right. my first question is, what got you interested in studying protein so closely? Well, I was doing Ironman since 1982. Um, when I started my residency training in 1974, Frank Shorter had won the Olympic marathon. My dad had had a near fatal heart attack. And it got me kind of motivated to get into fitness. And uh, I moved to San Diego for my training and everyone there was running. And I started running. I started doing marathons. And in uh, 1982, my best friend and I were watching Wide World of Sports, which 
you may not even were. I don't even know if you were alive at the time, but it was a it was a big sports show. It was on every Saturday afternoon, and they were showing this thing called Iron Man Hawaii. And the we when at the end of the race, the woman, the two women who were leading the women's race, uh, were from San Diego. Um, I was in a, a master swim program, and they were in the program. And uh, one of them that was leading about. Oh, 100 yards before the finish line, collapses. She tries to crawl. She tries to stand up. Her name's Julie Moss. And uh, the second place girl uh, passes her and wins the race. And my buddy and I were standing there watching this, and we said, oh, man, we got to do this race. That (laughs) That inspired us. So he said, great. He had opened a financial services business, and I was had a new pediatric and infectious disease practice. And he said, you give me all your extra money and I'll, I'll invest it for you. And in five years, we'll both be rich. And um, then we can train and do Ironman. <laughs> so I said, great. Except when I went to bed that night, I couldn't sleep. And I thought, oh no, I can't wait five years. And the last guy I gave money to lost all of it. So I got to do this now. So in the morning, I remember opening up opening up the newspaper and I looked under bicycles and I found a used Nishiki 10 speed bicycle and I bought it and I called the YMCA and I joined a swim program and I was already a runner. So, and I, I went on the website and this was February of 82 and that year they were going to have two Ironmans. They were going to move it to the fall. Um, and you could, you could apply at that time and just get in. Uh, so I applied and I got in and I talked a good friend of mine in into training with me. And on October 7th, uh, two, eight, nine, uh, 1982, we did Hawaii Ironman. Wow. Uh, <laughs> boy, it was tough. It was really tough. And we both finished in about 12 hours and 40 minutes. Um, we were both really disappointed, but we were we were sort of beaten by the race. and. I kept thinking, why did I ever want to do this? And I'm never doing this again. (laughs) Then we're in the plane on the way home. And there's probably 40 guys from San Diego that were there. And everybody had the same experience. But by the time we all commiserated together, by the time I got off the plane, six hours later in San Diego, I decided I was going to go back there because I wasn't going to let this thing beat me. And I was going to keep racing Ironman until I got the feeling that you know, in the last few miles of the marathon that I wasn't going to ask myself anymore, why did I ever decide to do this? And I was going to keep doing it until that happened. (laughs) So uh, eight Ironman Hawaii's later and 42 total Ironmans. Uh, I'm scheduled to do Ironman Louisville in seven weeks. I'm training hard. Uh, I still love it. And, And it's just, it works for me for my lifestyle. Now, it's funny because I went the first time by myself But I had three young children. I had a new practice. I was working on call in the hospital every third night. The schedule was crazy. Uh, And my wife said to me when I got home, she said, that's it. That's the last time you're doing that. You know, that's not fair. (laughs) I nodded, but I had already decided I was going back there. Yeah. So about in June, I said, honey, why don't we go to take the kids and go to Hawaii for a vacation? It's in like October would be good. And she (laughs) He said, smooth smooth oh, <laughs> that's a good idea good so we went there and then when we got there i said hey on saturday i'm doing the race and she's like oh my god so <laughs> it'll just take anyway. up all of saturday <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's right and so um she watched the race and she was a runner she was very into fitness and when she saw the race she understood it and she said i understand it you know, and I want to do triathlons now. Oh, cool. So she never did real long distance ones, but she's she's almost always a podium finisher in her age group. Uh, she does a lot of sprints and now and then Olympic race, Olympic distance race. And uh, she's hooked on it. So this worked for our family because then our kids started doing it. And that that's what got me going on it. And I, you know, it fit because I'm I'm into health. My my medical practice is really about getting people back their health because we see a lot of people who are whose health is really damaged. They have cancer or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or chronic fatigue or Lyme. You know, most of the patients I'm seeing are like that and their health is really damaged 
But in most cases, probably 85% of the time, we can get them back to health because we have a knowledge of, look, here's what it takes for a body to work, and here's what you have to do, here's what you have to eat, and here's the supplements that you need, and we can coax this thing back to a way higher level of function than what you're experiencing now. And for most people, it's really doable. And I feel the same way for myself. You know, I'm, I, I love doing this. I want to do this. There's, I think there's nobody 84 or older that's finished Ironman Hawaii. And, uh, you know, maybe someone will do it before I get there. It's another 13 years for me. But if not, you know, I want to win my age group when I'm 84 at Ironman Hawaii. You know, it's just like, it's fun. It's just like pure fun. And of course, camaraderie with guys that race and train is wonderful. You know, there here we are on the other side of the world and we share a very common reality. Yeah, it's so true. It's so true. Before we <clears throat> moved to Hong Kong, I didn't really know what the, the racing scene was going to be like here. I just knew we were close to the ocean and there was mountains to cycle on. And, uh, and of course, the scene here is fantastic. So, yeah, it's really neat. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the birthplace of triathlon is actually in San Diego. I used to live in San yes. Diego uh, right after college. I, I moved out there to work with my wife. Um, Fiesta Island, I think, is where it was birthed, Fiesta right? <laughs> you're born. You know, these, oh, these, these old guys, they, they all, they, they, they race the first one there. It's a terrible place to swim. <laughs> it you is. Know, doesn't look real clean in the water. <laughs> yeah. And they, we used, there used to be a Fiesta Island triathlon and it was, it, you know, it was a backwards. You'd, you, you, uh, swam last, uh, you ran first and then you rode and then you swim last, but they found a lot of guys were <laughs> like almost drowning. Yeah, and so, so. They, they, they switched it the other way around. But when, in the, when I was there, you know, there, there was a, there was this thing called the Wednesday ride and there'd be 60, 70 guys, uh, Tinley, Mark Allen, wow. um, Scott Molina, they all were there. And it was, uh, 60 miles from San Diego to Oceanside, pretty hard, but not bad. No stop, never stopped at a stoplight. It's like this swarm of, <laughs> of, of just a triathlon bees. And then as soon as the turnaround hit, it was just a race for home and it would be crazy. But, you know, like I never missed one because it was, you know, everybody was there and it was just really a lot of fun. Well, you probably got there faster than the cars did because I remember I had to commute from from La Jolla to Oceanside because I worked at wellness centers at two different places and it just felt like it took yeah. forever <laughs> to get there every morning. Yeah. Um, I, I think I read in your book that you actually had a, a hamstring injury that was uh, sort of the genesis of your interest in um, trying to he, uh, heal the body with with protein. Can you tell the story about that? Yeah, well, there's a story in the book. When I was I was into Boy Scouts as a kid, and um, when I was 13 years old, they took us on a – I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, and that's the, the home uh, factory for Oscar Mayer Meats. Uh, and so they took us on a tour of the Oscar Mayer meatpacking company and we saw the slaughterhouse. And when I left there, I was like, oh, this is terrible. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to become a vegetarian. And the scout leader was a vegetarian. And I think he was trying to get us all sort of there. Well, he got me there. And um, so I, I became a vegetarian. I was eating some dairy products and occasional fish, but mostly Mostly it was, you know, soybeans and brown rice and, you know, just pretty much vegan. Um, and I did that for a long time. I did that up until probably 12 or 15 years ago. And I got injured. I injured a hamstring and I, I, I've been racing really well, uh, but I injured it on a track workout and then I could not really get it to heal. I massaged it and chiropractored it and essential oiled it and injected it. I mean, I have access to anything and I could just not get it to really heal stably because every time I try to really push it, I would feel the pain. And I knew if I, if I went hard, I was going to really tear it and I'd be in trouble. And I met a guy who had been over in Europe and he had these uh, essential amino acids in a bottle. And he said, why don't you try these things? And, um, he said, take 10 of them every day and probably six weeks into it, I felt a real change. Like the muscle was healed, you know, hmm. and I went out to the track, uh, I was swimming at UCSD. There's a master's program up there. 
and there's a track and, and we would go to the track after the swim workouts and I could actually, I could actually do it. And I thought, holy smokes, you know, this is really something. Maybe my problem had been a nutritional deficiency because as a vegetarian, I wasn't getting enough amino acids. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed a couple things happened. I gained about, uh, I think, 10 pounds of lean body mass with no change in my appearance at all. Hmm. And I started looking into it and I was, I found that as a vegetarian, I had been protein deficient the whole time and my bone density and my muscles and my connective tissue had been undernourished and that they filled in when I was getting enough essential amino acids. Wow. The second, it was, it was like really like, like eye opening. Then about once a month at that time, I was doing kind of a maximum, uh, uh, maximum heart rate test. And my maximum heart rate had been like 174 for a long time. And I went up, I got to up to 186. I thought, boy, this is really a change. Wow. Like my cardiac output is really better and my maximum tolerance is better. I went to Ironman, um, Canada and I had my best race ever, um, uh, I finished in a little bit over 11 hours. Uh, and that was, I was like, wow, this is really good. And I wrote an article in triathlon magazine about my experience. This is just my experience. Now I had started a nutrition company before that. And after I wrote the article, uh, mo and most of the products that we had in the nutrition company were, were detoxification products, like people with heavy metals and, you know, and, and things like that. Um, and I started to put the amino acids into my practice because I was seeing people with chronic illness and I found, boy, they detox faster and they felt better. And the guys who were trying to build muscle, they built muscle faster. So I write this article for Triathlete Magazine and we get like over a thousand inquiries on it. Wow. Like everybody, everybody wants it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so then we, we started to formulate it and we started to sell it and, uh, we call it perfect amino. Um, and then one of my, one of my, my really very close friends was a doctor for the, uh, Lance Armstrong, uh, Radio Shack. But in those days it was, a, I forgot what was, it was some other name. I forgot who sponsored them for, oh, well, U.S. Postal. Postal, yeah. And, um, and he said, so he was using them and he was like, these are really good. I'm going to take some over there. So they took some over there and the three top guys on the team took them. And what he told me was astounding because he said, you know, they get the best nutrition that was known at the time. They have a doctor on site, include he, this guy's a chiropractor. So he did all their physical medicine. Uh, his name's Jeff Spencer. He doesn't mind me talking about it. Uh, he'd be a great guest for you. He's an incredible guy. Oh, great. Uh, I mean, he has worked with Tiger Woods and you two and, and he's just worked with the, the biggest NASCAR celebrity um, guys in the world as a coach and a counselor and he's he was an olympic athlete himself he was a he was a track sprinter um and uh he's an he's an incredible guy and and anyway so he said i'm gonna take um and and lance would hire him for a spring prep and a tour and he said he's the guy that can do anything and makes the team go and that's the kind of guy he is if you need something you call jeff wow. you got a physical problem you need to talk something out with someone that's bothering you, you just call Jeff because Jeff will handle it. And, um, so he did seven tours with seven wins. Um, wow. yeah. Uh, so anyway, he gave it to the top three guys. And what he told me afterwards was astounding because he said, these guys have any nutrition that they want. You know, they finish a race, they get rehydrated, they get IVs, they get vitamins, they have a chef there, they cook them all the best stuff that they can get. But he said, by the end of the tour, they were always broken down. Everybody had tendonitis. Everybody was sore. You know, everybody was hurting. And he said, when we gave him perfect amino, by the end of the tour, the three guys that were taking the, uh, taking the amino acids, they weren't broken down. They were wow. stronger. You know, that if you gave the body what it really needed in terms, this was in terms of amino acids, but the, of course the body needs fatty acids and calories and all kinds of other stuff, vitamins, and minerals, but that that they were able to keep up with the stress and trauma of the race if they were taking enough essential amino acids. And, um, and that's been proven a couple of different times with different kinds of athletes that you can stress the heck out of it, 
But if you keep up, the body can pretty much keep up and you become stronger at the end rather than broken down. That's that's amazing. And I think, you know, that's an interesting case study with the Tour de France guys, because to your point, yeah, they've got everything under the sun um, to help them recover, including sometimes things that aren't necessarily legal. Right. They've got right. they've got anything that they need. Um, so that's right. super interesting that the the essential aminos were sort of the missing link because for whatever reason they weren't able to to draw that from from their nutrition the the really good nutrition that they were getting which which leads me to my next question so and you see this in your practice too from what i read in your book uh, you started yeah. doing the screening on patients the amino acid screening that you're right. able to do with i think it's a blood and urine test and you found that most people whether they were somewhat healthy or or, or really diseased we're low in at least one of the eight essential amino acids. Um, so that's right. yeah. So, but why do you think this is? Why why can't we get what we need f- from food? Even the Tour de France guys that had the perfect nutrition. Do you think it's because of like poor poor soil quality or the uh, the chemical cocktail that's sort of in animal products now, or, or a combination of the things? Or why do you think it is that we can't get what we need out of food just regularly? Well, because it's really hard. The, the, the digestion and absorption of protein is pretty complex, which means you need a healthy stomach and you need a healthy small intestine. In order to digest protein, you have to have a stomach that will, that will, that will make stomach acid. There's an enzyme in the stomach called pepsin, and pepsin is the first step in protein digestion. It, proteins are made up of long chains of smaller units called amino acids. So a way that people can understand this, if we put it in a, like in terms of language. So we have letters which make up an alphabet. So in English, we have 26 letters and you can put the letters together in different combinations and you can end up with the English language which has, I don't know, three or 400,000 words. Right. Now some, let, some words are really short, like A or I, they only have one letter. Some words are really long and they might have 26 or 27 letters, but each, each word is made up of smaller units, letters. And so protein chemistry is the same. There is an alphabet and this alphabet of so-called letters are called amino acids. Hmm. There's 22 of them that are usually used in the human body. So we have 26, 22 different amino acids and you can put these into different combinations and you get different proteins. Now, some proteins are really short, like thyroid hormone. It isn't technically a protein, but it's an amino acid that's got three iodines on it. So that would technically be the simplest protein. Okay, proteins usually have like 30 or more amino acids, but it's a very simple one. It's a one-lettered one. Right. If you looked at growth hormone, I think there's uh, 69 amino acids. <laughs> if you look at insulin, I think it's 89 amino acids. If you look at skeletal muscle, like one fiber, one basic unit of, of skeletal muscle has 5,700 amino acids wow. for one fiber. So it's a language, and the language is spelled in amino acids, and then proteins are the result. And in the human body, there are around 50,000 different proteins. Skin, wow. hair, nails, immune cells, enzymes, you know, all these things are proteins. So and that's basically the structure of the body. So you have to be able to create these things as fast as they're needed and in many different places. And if you don't have a healthy stomach that's got stomach acid, now about 25 million prescriptions per month are given to people to block stomach acid. So drugs like oh, Tagamet, wow. Epsid, and Nexium, and now they don't even... They're not even prescription. They're over the counter. And if you look in the drug books, these things are supposed to be used on a temporary basis for serious things only. Because when you stop stomach acid, you open yourselves up to not digesting protein and not killing bacteria when they come in because you have a salad. It's not sterile. Right. You know, it's got bacteria and funguses and maybe parasites. You eat some sushi, you got raw fish, there's likely parasites in there. And this stuff, if you don't, the the body design is that you'll have acid in your stomach 
And when that stuff hits the acid, these living organisms, the bacteria or the funguses or the parasites, hit the acid, they get killed. So then when it goes deeper into your body, in your intestine, they're not there. But if you have no acid, they get through. Oh my. And you don't digest your protein. Now, when those guys get through, they set up shop in your small intestine. And most doctors today will tell you there's this thing called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Like these bacteria then get into your small intestine, which isn't supposed to have bacteria. The bacteria is supposed to be lower in your colon. Now you get bacteria growing in your upper intestine. They ferment, they produce gas, they produce acids, they can produce spasm and feeling bad. And they damage the membrane, which is supposed to absorb the digested proteins. So now you have two problems. You're not breaking the proteins down so they can be digested, and you've got a, a membrane that won't absorb them. So protein mal digestion and malabsorption is very common. It's almost everybody. Wow. Wow. And I know one of the great things about your formulation with perfect amino um, is, is pre-digested, right? Like it, it, it can bypass whatever issues somebody might have, right. or most people probably have in their digestive system, right? Right. Because it's, it's, it's amino acids. It, they're, they're pharmaceutical grade amino acids. They are the basic particle. And a lot of amino acid blends are mixed. They're, they're, see, the body can only digest amino acids with a left-handed tilt. When, when amino acids are manufactured, they're manufactured left tilt and right tilt. Oh, it's so like give, L-arginine and L-tyrosine. That's what the L means? That's what the L means. Okay. They, the configuration is left. The body can't do right. So, oh. if, so cheap amino acid products are usually 50-50 mixes, and the 50% of it right away is not usable. Uh, also, in amino acids, it's really important that you get pure, like pharmaceutical grade, pure amino acids because companies manufacture these things and they're not pure, and they can be they can be adulterated with various kinds of chemicals and contaminants, and you don't want to be taking those things. So the the you you want the premier product, you know, you want it you you want it so it's really pure, and there there aren't any contaminants or anything added to it that would could possibly make you sick. In 1989, there was some contaminated amino acids out of Japan and a whole bunch of people died and they got sick and it was a big deal. So, wow. uh, so you want to make sure that the quality of the product that you're getting is really the highest quality. Then, then you have a safe product. What, do you remember what year you started making the perfect amino product? I looked back just for fun. I looked back on my Amazon ordering history and I started ordering it in 2015, which I think was probably when Ben talked about it on a show once. But what year did you guys start making that? Well, we started you. We, we it was originally manufactured by someone else where we and, and we were selling it for probably the last 10 years. OK, um, it went off patent in uh, at the time we started manufacturing it, and then we were able to do it. It was coming from Europe and there was problems with supply. There was problems with price because it was it was just it was too expensive for people to take. So we were able to do it at a, you know, the highest quality with a really good price because you got to take a bunch of this stuff if you're going to get any benefit out of it. Right. And so it, 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 it was sort of a perfect match for the market. Gotcha. Well, I'm interested, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm plant-based, I'm vegan, and I've had pretty good success with it myself. I, I've been doing it for almost six years. Um, I'm leaner, I'm stronger, I have less fat, I have more muscle. I'm pretty regimented though. I'm, I imagine some other vegans may not be. Um, I take my B12, I, I take essential aminos, thanks to you and Ben. Uh, I take a multivitamin, I take creatine, I take a greens formula, I take blackstrap molasses, so I get my iron and calcium. Um, yeah. I do strength training, cardio, mobility. I, I pretty much cover all my bases. But it is interesting about your hamstring injury. I've had a hamstring injury and a couple of shoulder things. It seems like it takes me longer to recover than I used to. And I am older <laughs> than I used to be. So that could be it, I suppose. But I wondered if maybe amino acids might be, I may not be taking enough. I usually would just take five grams in the morning before I would do a workout or uh, you're shaking your head. No. So I, I think that's probably it. So after I read your book, I was like, oh, maybe that's it. Maybe it's, right. I need to be, it sounded like I needed to be taking more like 20 grams. So what I've been doing, well, take, I, yeah, take 10, take 10 right away when you get up. Okay. And then on hard days, you could experiment with take 10 more. Okay. So then you end up with 20. So 20 and do grams. it for six, eight weeks. See, but don't take more than 10 at a time. 
because I don't think it's utilized well enough. So like 10 grams. Guys, we were giving them 10 three times a day. Okay. Like maximum 30. Okay. So 10 grams is probably about as much as we can assimilate at, at, at one time, you're guessing? At one go. Okay. Yeah. And then probably, um, unless you're really active, probably wait two hours before you take a second dose. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, I find, so I'm training for the Ironman now. So I'm, I'm, I'm fine that I take 10 grams as soon as I get up. And then if I go for a long ride, like five, six hour ride, I'll put one scoop, which is five grams in my, in my bottles. And I'll take five grams every hour. I'll drink a water bottle every hour and I'll have five grams of amitos in there. And, uh, you know, some beet powder and a couple other things. But, but I think getting, keeping the amino acid streaming, if you're doing long distance stuff makes a difference. I think it makes a difference in brain function. I think you don't feel the bonk. I think you, I stay mo way more alert, like even after five hours. Like I feel like I'm really alert. I'm not sort of spaced and, and, and not doing well. And I think the aminos really keep that level good and keep your brain thinking that there's plenty of stuff around and then it'll, it'll command your muscles to keep going. Yeah, I remember reading that, that the central nervous system benefits of aminos are pretty astounding. Of the essential aminos are, are pretty astounding too. Okay. And actually the last time I ordered perfect aminos, uh, you guys threw in a packet of the powder that you're talking about. I put that in my bike bottle actually yesterday and I like it cause it's just, a, it's uh it's sweetened with stevia. doesn't have any of the garbage in it. It's, so it's basically just essential aminos and a little, a little stevia and, and some flavoring. It was good. So I'll keep trying yeah. that, but I'm, I'm interested in your story. Um, because in the back of my head, I'm always like, okay, I've been doing vegan for a while. I've had good results, but I'm in the back of my head. I'm always worried or wondering, and the, I, I'm sort of more into the philosophical part of it now too, I suppose with, with the planet and the animals and stuff. But I want to know sort of what made you decide, cause you're, you're no longer vegetarian, right? Right. Um, so what was it that was sort of the aha moment for you when, when you decided to go ahead and, and switch back? Well, I was at a medical conference and Lauren Cordain was the keynote speaker. Now, Lauren Cordain is a professor of exercise physiology at Colorado state university He's more or less the father of the paleo movement. Mm -hmm. And he started writing books on paleo diet and paleo nutrition. And what is the origin? Like, like if we look at, at humans as a species, you know, like we've been the earliest fossils go back about tw two million, two and a half million years. The original populations were hunter gatherers. So they roamed around in family clans and they ate what they could get. And what was growing between negative two and a half million years ago and maybe up to 10,000 years ago? Well, it was small animals and fish. A lot of that period was ice age. There wasn't any vegetables. There wasn't any nuts. There wasn't any fruits because the friggin' planet was iced. Right. And it was really cold. And all they ate was, you know, seals and whatever else they could find. Right. Okay. But, but. And, and roughly 10,000 years ago, there was a, the, the, it went from paleo, paleo in Greek means old. Uh, so paleolithic, lith is stone, so they were stone agers. They used flints for their tools and their weapons. And then the, the culture changed around 10,000 years ago where they settled in communities. They became farmers. They learned how to domesticate animals to get their milk. And then, and then you know, since that time, until now that that's been stables for the for for our diets okay now the last 50 years the food's gone really to hell with genetic modification and artificial fertilizers and all this stuff and and you know and confining animals and you know all the horrendous things that go on with whether it's oscar meyer or some other thing of just what they're doing to animals you know and all the psychological stuff that goes on with animals too you know the fear and they're you know they can't walk and they you know it's just like it's i it's terrible. Um, but I think that that there's no long term vegetarian populations on Earth that I know of. Our genetics, ninety nine point nine percent of our genetic track was not vegan based. You know, it was animal based so that if you're going to do a switch, some people can do it successfully where they can be vegans and they can thrive. Some of it has to do with their gut bacteria. Now, some people are able to colonize themselves with bacteria that can make essential amino acids out of non-essential amino acids. Bacteria can do this. And you may have 
the right mix. Most people's guts are a mess and the bacteria that are in there are a mess. And the bacteria give them signals of I've got to eat sugar and I've got to have pizza. And if I don't get it, I'm going to die or I feel bad or I feel like my blood sugar is going down or I get headaches. But it's their bad bacteria. You know, if they if they if they work on it and they can get eating right foods for a while, their cravings get to be for good things. Like I noticed that t today when at, I came home for lunch, it's like like we'd had a salad last night. It was some cut up cabbage and avocados and some watermelon seeds. And, and I I. I was like, oh man, I gotta have that. You know, like like my cravings were for really good things. Yeah. And I think when you get to that point, your your body's get organizing in the right way. If you're waking up in the middle of the night and you know, if I don't have some pizza, I may not make it till morning, you gotta work on your gut back. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It's telling you the wrong <laughs> things. It doesn't matter. Yeah. So so anyway, that that we get that um so you can do it, but it just isn't very native to us. Right. And um, I think like in your case, some, you know, some really good testing on serum essential amino acids and vitamins and minerals. You know, there's I don't know what your lab availability there is, but it's probably pretty good where and I do this on everybody. I did this. I do this on everybody. And I see some high end, real high end athletes, too. And we test the heck out of them and you find stuff. Right. And if they're vegans, they got more challenges. There's very few vegans or even vegetarians that I've tested. And this is hundreds and hundreds of cases where they really are doing fine in their essential amino acids. And usually their hormone levels get affected by it. Right. And and, um, you know, and then when you start looking at people's gut bacteria and their do they have stomach acid? And are they making enough enzymes to digest their food that you find these little things where. You know, this is sort of a weak point where then the body can only go so far with it or heal so fast with it. Uh, proteins are a big part of it, amino acids, but there's a lot of other things too that are really important. Well, that's a good point. So, you know, have your own belief system and do your best and better living through science, but get tested because the tests won't lie, right? Make sure that you're covering all your bases and just understand what your body's, maybe it works for me, but it doesn't work for somebody else. That's right, because each person is exactly unique, and it, you it's can't like a go from right. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a, it's a fingerprint, right? And so for you, because you were you're interested in this stuff, I test myself about every six to eight months. Okay. Costs about three grand, but you get the test, you look, you see. And I had once that was really interesting. My blood, my my fasting blood sugar started to go up. Okay, now if I would have gone to a regular doctor, so my fasting blood sugar, you know, I like it to be under ninety. But it starts to climb, and then it's like 104, 105. What the heck's going on here? If I would have gone to a regular doctor, he would have said, "Oh, you just got prediabetes. So why don't you take metformin, or you know, why don't you do something like this?" So I, it was time to roll out the tests, and I do the tests, and I find that my serum chromium level is really low. Now, chromium is a mineral; it's needed for insulin to work. It comes out in the sweat. I was doing a lot of sauna at the time, and I started to take high doses of chromium. Okay. And I took the chromium for a couple of months and then I'm testing my blood sugar. It goes right back down to 89 and it was a nutritional deficiency. I'm careful, but you just can't cover it all. It's way too complicated. And, you know, we, we also test people for environmental toxins and we are, we, we are full. We are all full. And so you kind of have to have to have to have a strategy for that too. Like, how can I get this stuff? through me because it's coming in no matter what I do because it's everywhere the exposure is so high like where you are holy smokes it's, <laughs> I'm working with a woman right now she's she's actually a, a a young adult she's in her she's in her early 20s and she's a she was her father worked for the state department and she was over in China mm -hmm. and she's a really like at 16 she was like a, a international distance swimmer like phenom wow. okay and she was swimming in races in some of the rivers in China and lakes in China. I don't even know what is in China, but somewhere, but they were in China and she was swimming there. And when she came back, she had chronic fatigue. She couldn't swim. She was really sick. All her blood clotting stuff was just totally messed up. And um, we measured levels of chemicals and pesticides in her that the lab had never, ever seen before. Oh, and she no. absorbed them with swimming and, you know, maybe you swallow a little bit of water, but it comes, it comes in through the skin. So, you know, 
this is just another factor. And if you don't have enough amino acids, you're not going to detoxify. So yeah, it all kind of works together. You, uh, have you ever seen, uh, it's a, it's a TV show, the show house, the doctor house. Uh, not in a long time, but I've seen it before. Well, when I was reading your book, one of the great things that you have is different case studies. And, um, yep. you just reminded me of like a real life house, like with your ability to figure out what issues people have that, you know, a regular MD hasn't been able to figure out before. And one of the stories that stands out, um, is the, uh, girl that was the go-kart racer. Could you, could you share that story with our audience about how you figured out that she was having uh, t toxic levels? I think it was gasoline. Yeah, MTBE. It's a it's a it's a gasoline additive that boosts octane. So they put it in gasoline. So she's 12 years old, and she's got a story that for nine or 10 months she'd been out of school, exhausted, couldn't get up, couldn't study. Was seen at the University of Florida pediatric hospital. She'd been seen by all the good guys, and they tested her and they couldn't find anything. And they thought, okay, she's she's just she's early menarche. You know, she's having psychological problems. Give her psych drugs. Uh, she, that didn't work. The parents didn't like it. And then she, so she ended up on our place. You know, the average person that I see is seeing 12, 12 or 13 doctors. Wow. So we're sort of the, we we play house. I play house every day. Yeah. You're the diagnostic it's guy. It, it's incredible. So I saw her and I interviewed her and I examined her and I did our, our sort of normal test battery, which includes environmental toxins. And it came back that the MTB level in her now at, all of us have gasoline, this gasoline additive in us because it's when gasoline burns, it goes in the atmosphere and we breathe it. It also goes in the soil with rain. It's washed into the aquifer when you shower and when you drink, if your water isn't well filtered, you're going to absorb it through your skin with showering or, or wow. by drinking. Okay. Wow. So you get it, you get it all those ways and inhale it. If you're, you know, if you're, if, if it's around. So her level normal that I see around here is about 5,000 real normals, none, because you shouldn't have any in your body, but 5,000 is probably average of what I see. And hers was 39,000. And the lab called me oh. because it's the highest they'd ever seen in a young person like that. So I sat the and they, they said, well, what is she doing? Is she, you know, is she, is she sniffing gasoline? Is she a painter? Is she washing her hands and brushes and gasoline? You know, like, where is this coming from? So I sat down with the parents and I interviewed them again when I had this data. And they were like, oh, my God, she had decided a year before, two years before, that she wanted to be the next Danica Patrick. You know, Danica Patrick's a NASCAR driver and she's a female and she wins and she wanted to do that. So they had set her up with lessons driving midget race cars on a track in an enclosed areas, and you'd be spending about three hours on weekends each day, Saturday and Sunday, on the track, breathing the fumes, and in her body, she absorbed a lot of it, was unable to detoxify it, and she had this massive fatigue and brain problem, couldn't learn whole thing. Mm. And when we found that out, we got her detoxified, the levels came all the way down to five, and she woke up, and she was fine. Wow. So it's, it's and I have a guy now, I just saw him, He's, he's in Germany. He's an architect. And he came because he's got chronic fatigue. About three quarters of our patients come from, you know, everywhere. Um, and so it turned out his, her, hers had been 39,000 for this MTBE. His was 71,000. Oh, my. And he was having trouble with fatigue, and he said he couldn't concentrate. And he's, you know, he's an architect. He's got to be able to look at very detailed things and figure them out. It turns out that his, so I started saying, you've got to be getting this from somewhere now. Let's go through your day. Let's go through your life. Where is this coming from? It turns out his architecture practice office is above the central gas, uh, bus station in his city. Oh. And the buses come in and out of there. And they thought they had the air filtered, but it wasn't filtered. And, and, and he was toxic. Wow. So people, <laughs> yeah, so... Um, so these can get you, you know, you need amino acids too, but you need to not have all this other stuff going on at the same time. And I saw you mentioned too, like 
we all toxify differently. It's sort of that fingerprint example again. And so you could have two people. Well, in his example, there's a whole bunch of people working in that building, but he was the only one that wasn't being able to get rid of the toxins effectively. So I think that's just, you know, speaks to your point about make sure you get tested because you may be in an environment that other people are thriving and just fine, but you may not be yourself. That's right. You know, everyone's got the uncle that, Drinks a quart of Jim Bean every day and smokes two packs of Lucky Strikes, and he's ninety and he feels fine. Right, really, you know, and he has no teeth and he's fine. But you know, it's a, it's a, it's the the very elite of the elite of genetics that make it through that. Yeah, most of us are human and vulnerable. Right, and and getting more so because I mean, if you look at the overall health of of certainly the U.S. population, because I don't know at other places very as well. But the incidence of chronic illness, of autism, of anxiety, depression, autoimmune disease, cancer, the rates are soaring. Right. And it isn't an accident. It's because the nutrition sucks and the environment sucks. And you put those two things together and we're, you know, we're biology. We're living life. And, these, and there's rules. And if you violate the rules on a sort of a cell basis that cell's not going to be able to thrive. It's going to not be able to produce energy. Then, then you're not going to feel well. Before we leave the topic of, of veganism and vegetarianism, I'm interested to get your thoughts on um, this report that just came out. It's a, a global consultancy, A.T. Kearney, um, predicts by 2040, o- over 60% of meat will be made in a lab um, or it'll be some sort of plant-based alternative. So what do you think about lab meat? It's obviously going to be more animal friendly. It's going to be better for our environment. There would presumably be no tox toxins in it from pesticides because it's, you know, in a controlled environment. I was thinking, you know, we could even add essential amino acid formulation to it. You know, I mean, if we're going to be better living through science, uh, but, right. but what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I mean, we're, the world is going toward chemical, it, it's a chemical society. You know, you're going to take a pill in the morning, you know, it's, it's going to be Morpheus, you know, take the pill <laughs> that makes you feel the way you want to feel. I don't know. You know, the biggest one right now in the U S is Burger King. They got a plant burger. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's huge, but it's genetically modified soybeans. It's full of glyphosate. It's a poison mm-hmm. product. You know, it's not good. It's not that I'm okay with the idea and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm great with the idea, but you got to get, you know, you can't give somebody something that's worse than what they're already taking. Right. It's just bad under the guise of health. And so I think that, um, you know, I think if it was done well and done right, you know, maybe it's possible. There's people doing things now with plants and soil that's going to rehabilitate this planet. If not, we're going to all be gone. Right. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, five, six generations, the thing is, if we keep going the way we're going, there, there, we don't be. There nobody's gonna be left. Half That's the exactly men right. I see are sterile, and half the women I see are sterile. The swim, the sperm won't swim. Wow. They're, they, they can't, they can't do it. They're sick. They're toxic. So you're so, behind it as long as it's done properly, no GMOs, um, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, I eat probably as many plant-based foods as any plant-based person. Okay, <laughs> and I make sure I get enough perfect amino. And I eat some meat. I mean, I'm concerned with, I'm concerned with our whole food supply. Right. You know, it's, 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 a mess. it's, it's, <laughs> it's a mess. Yeah. yeah. And, talk- and there's so much, there, there's so much, you know, oh, it's organic, but God, it's, it's a lie. You know, it's not. So, you so know? there's situations where people are claiming, um, like produce is organic produce, but it's not actually, yeah. uh, that's yeah. scary. Yeah. And the nutrition value of plants, you know, it's probably half or a quarter of what it really was when it was, you know, it was really in real good topsoiled earth and rainwatered. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a different, it was a different thing. Yeah. Not full of pesticides and all that stuff that cuts the nutrient quality down and does who knows what else to us. Right. All right. I want to try to talk a little science with you. Now your science is well above mine, so I'll try to keep up with you. Um, but one of the ways you're able to measure the 
uh, bioavailability, I guess, of the perfect amino is through a formulation or a test, I guess I should say, called amino acid utilization or AAU. Um, yeah. And I've, I've seen uh, just in a little bit of research, uh, another test called nitrogen protein utilization. Are those two tests the same or is there some differences between those two? Here's the, here's the, the, the sort of basic idea. The three basic food groups are carbohydrates and proteins and fats. Right. All of them share carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So all of them have that. Amino acids alone have nitrogen. And um, amino in Greek is nitrogen. So it's the, these, are, these are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen uh, structures that have nitrogen as a part of them. Whereas a carbohydrate and a fat have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but no nitrogen. No nitrogen, okay. Okay. Now, you can calculate that a protein, a basic protein, whether you take um, soybeans or quinoa or beefsteak, that a basic protein by weight has approximately 15% nitrogen of the whole structure by weight is about 16% nitrogen. So let's say you take whey protein and you say, okay, I want to see, now if that nitrogen is incorporated, so the guy eats the protein. Now the reason when you eat the protein, what you want to have happen is that that protein or the amino acids in that protein get turned from cow or milk or, or, or bean protein into your protein because our body needs to rebuild our proteins. Okay. Whether it's an enzyme or whether it's a skin or something, it doesn't matter. A neurotransmitter. So, so you can measure, you could do a, you can do a study and this is how this thing was originally done. You take, um, 30, you take 90 people each of whom have been on a very good dietary regimen for a few months such that they're in what we call nitrogen balance. You know, they're getting enough protein in and utilizing it so they're not breaking down at all. And so they're in nitrogen balance. Okay. And then what you do is you take 30 of them and you give them eggs as their only source of protein whole chicken egg. Okay. Okay. And you feed them that protein for 30 days. The second group of 30, you, you digest the egg protein. It's called hydrolyzed egg protein. You digest it all so that it's all broken down into basic egg proteins. So is that a pill that they would take then or? It's probably powder. A powder. Okay. It's probably a powder. And all of them, it all looked like powder when they took it because it was blinded. They didn't know what they were oh, getting. Nice. Okay. And and they knew that they were going to get a month of egg powder, a month of pre-digested egg powder, and a month of perfect amino. Okay. 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 And then they were going to all do each thing. Okay. So they do a month, and then the next month they do the next one, and then the next month they do the next one. Okay. And while they were doing it, they knew exactly how many grams of nitrogen they were taking in their allotment of protein every day. So let's just say for, so it's easy to calculate is they were getting a hundred grams of protein, a hundred grams of nitrogen every day. Right. Okay. And they collected their urine through the whole time. So it's three months. I mean, yeah, it's three months, 30 days, 30 days, 30 days. And they collected their urine the whole time and they measured how much nitrogen was coming out based on how much nitrogen went in. Okay. And if you're utilizing the nitrogen, it doesn't come out. Right. <laughs> you eat it and you make muscle, that nitrogen is not coming out because right. it's part of your muscle, okay, or part of your liver or some enzyme, okay? And what they found was eggs either way, whether they're pre-digested or not, that 48% of the nitrogen that went in stayed in. Wow, so they lost over half. They lost over half. Okay. Okay. And with perfect amino, 
99% stayed in. Wow. That's pretty so hard to argue with because you had three different groups do it too. I mean, everybody tried everything. So that's right. And so this is, this is amino acid utilization. The amino acid that were utilized, or, or you could say, you could say net nitrogen utilization. The higher the utilization of the amino acids or of the nitrogen, because you're really measuring nitrogen, the better quality of protein that you have. Now, right. the, the, the perfect, we call it perfect amino because the perfect blend of amino acids gives you 99%. If you change any of the component of how much of each one of the eight essential amino acids are in there, you get a lower number. Uh, okay. So it's not like 0.75 grams of tyrosine and 0.7. It's a, it's different levels of each one of those to make up the that's five right. gram serving. Okay. That's right. That's right. And it's out to the thousandths of a gram. So that's, that's I mean, the sweet sauce. One, five, three. Okay. Okay. Now this is very interesting because if you look in scientific circles and you say, well, how many, um, uh, the United States says, okay, there's eight essential amino acids, but there's two conditional ones, you know, histidine and arginine. If it's a baby or an old person or a stressed person, they need more. Mm -hmm. Health Canada says there's 10 essential amino acids. And if you don't put 10 essential amino acids <laughs> in your formula, we're not going to let you sell it in Canada as a complete formula. Hmm. So the formula was created for Canada so that it could get by Health Canada with the two extra conditional amino acids in. And when the balance studies were done, guess what? it went from 99% utilization to 94% utilization. Wow. Because those extra okay. two, we just don't, adults don't need, right? It's not that they don't need, but they dilute the other things. Oh, I and see. And they make Sorry. it because the cell can't use it. The cell can't use it. So we did a study, a small study, but we did a study saying, okay, what if you give someone, do a baseline, baseline glucose in the serum, baseline insulin in the serum, and baseline amino acids in the serum. Give somebody 10 grams of amino acids. At 30 minutes and 90 minutes, measure their glucose, their insulin, and their levels of amino acids. And what we found is their glucose didn't change, their insulin didn't get a bump. So if you're doing ketosis, this is great because you it won't take you out of ketosis. And what we found is that the two conditional amino acids, histidine and arginine, they went up drastically within 30 minutes of giving the basic eight. The body just said, we need some of this, make it. Oh, and then it was interesting. Good. Interesting. Yes. So they're not really conditional amino acids or they're not essential amino acids. If you take the right mix of the eight essential amino acids, your body can make anything. Wow. All right. I'm going to play devil's advocate here because that's a pretty okay. hard study to argue with. Um, yes. But I know a lot of yeah. folks... Can like, I can I can I just please can I, can I interrupt you for a minute because I want to just I want to give one more shade of this thing okay which is if you know what the what the exact formula is for the perfect blend for that optimizes human nutrition now in a bird and a dog it's going to be different because their their needs are different right okay because they're not humans but if you then say okay what's the mix what's the mix of essential amino acids in whey protein. What would the amino acid utilization be in whey protein? Well, it sucks. It's 16%. 16, okay. Okay. Soybeans are like 17%. Meat and fish are like 32, 33%. Okay. The only thing better than eggs is breast milk. It's 49%. Okay. Wow. Okay. Now we looked at spirulina, 24 strains of spirulina. You go to the health food store and say, ah, spirulina. It's magic food. It grows, it grows whales. That's all they eat. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Right. Out of the 24 strains that were tested, 18 of them had no nitrogen retention because they're missing essential amino acids. Six of them had a 6% utilization. It is a wonderful food. There is chlorophyll. There is minerals. There is some omega threes. There is vitamins. But don't fool yourself in thinking that the amino acids are going to build you because they aren't the right blend. Gotcha. This is also true of collagen with this massive thing going on with collagen right now. Collagen is missing an essential amino acid, the tryptophan. And 50% of the amino acids are non-essential ones. You know, it's proline, hydroxyproline, glycine. They're, it's not the stuff we need to make proteins for our body. 
Right. No, it's not bad. It ends up being calories because the body can't use it with the nitrogen. It takes the nitrogen off. Now you have a car. Now you have a carb. Gotcha. Right. You got a carbon hydrogen oxygen chain. You got a carb, and the body either turns it into fat or glycogen or it burns it. Same th- Same problem with BCAAs. Okay. The the branch chain amino acids. People say, oh, branch chain amino acids. I'm weightlifting. I'm going to get branch chain amino acids. There's zero utilization with three. Now, their branch chains are essential amino acids, but it's only three out of eight. You might as well have a banana because (laughs) what's happening is it's getting turned into a carb and you're getting the calories. You get some muscle sparing from it, but you're not building anything new. And bananas a little cheaper than a big old bottle of BCAAs. (laughs) Yeah. Tastes better, too. Okay. So so that's hard to argue with with the with the um, AAU and the study that you shared. So I just, I want to get your side of this because I know some uh, supplement companies use a different formula for calculating amino acid score. So there's this other one called protein digestibility corrected amino acid score. (laughs) Use that one in a a trivia game, right? PDCAAS is what we'll say. Um, Right. I understand it right. It's milligrams of limiting amino acid in one gram of test protein divided by the milligrams of the same amino acid in one gram of reference protein by the fecal true digestibility percentage. Hopefully you know more about that than I do, but I want to hear your take on that. See, it's digestibility. Digestibility isn't the important thing. It's utilization. See, it doesn't matter if you can digest it. So you take whey protein and your body digests it great. So there isn't any whey protein left over when it comes out because the amino acids have been digested and they have been absorbed. But if you measure utilization in, in dairy protein and whey protein, it's only 16%. Ah, I see. I you see, see the difference? Okay. It's fool- yes. It fools people because all you care about is you want to get food that is going to build, that is going to make available abundant amino acids so that you can, your body can then make those into whatever it needs. And when you measure serum amino acids, you get a reflection of that. You got low essential amino acids. See, the way a, the way a protein is built is that, so you eat some cow protein, there's 5,700 amino acids in one fiber. So you eat it, you digest it, you absorb all those amino acids in your blood. Then they go to the muscle fiber. Now the muscle fiber has to reassemble human muscle, right. 5,700 per fiber, okay? But if, like in whey protein, of the amino acids aren't the ones that muscle needs to make muscle. It can't use them. And so what it does then is it pulls the nitrogen off. It uses it for a carb. And then the nitrogen goes to the liver. It gets turned into urea. It goes to the kidney and it gets peed out. So technically it's being digested, but it's not being utilized. Utilized. Right. And that's the key thing. And, and so you, and, and you look clinically, you look at people with, that have end-stage kidney disease or end-stage liver disease. They're all put on diets which are low in amino acids because they can't handle the nitrogen. Their, their body can't handle the nitrogen because they can't detoxify it. Okay. And if you look at those populations, they all their skin breaks down, their enzymes break down, their immune systems break down, they get infections, that, that's what kills them. You can give them perfect amino because the amino acids are utilized. They don't make nitrogen out of it. Right. And so the the kid the liver doesn't have to handle it and the kidney doesn't have to clear it. And they can maintain their skin and they can maintain their immune system and they can maintain their health, even though they've got a major problem with two organs. Gotcha. So this is a, medically, this is very significant. It makes a big and difference just because they don't have to digest, digest it or break it down. They don't have to handle excess nitrogen that's not being utilized. Gotcha. Because nitrogen is toxic to the body. That's why we... That's why we have to turn it into something when it's not utilized to, to get it out. Because if your nitrogen level builds up, for those of you that follow blood tests, BUN is blood urea nitrogen. If you're eating excess protein then your body can use, assuming you're well hydrated and your kidney function's normal, you just created a lot of nitrogen by what you ate dietarily and your body can't handle it. And so the levels go up. In kidney failure, the levels go up because your kidneys can't get rid of it. Is there um, a resource that you know of? I know you've got a list in your book of 10 or so of just uh, the AAU or the amino acid utilization of just, you know, basic foods 
Is there a study or a resource anywhere that you are aware of? Um, there is one, but it's not been published. There was a big argument between the American Dietetic Society and the somebody who worked out this whole thing, and he wanted a lot of money and they didn't want to pay him, and so it's sitting in his basement. Oh, shoot. <laughs> so, no. The basic ones are, you know, and that's the other problem with, 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 with plant-based foods is that the amino acid profile, the amino acid blend is it's going to make them low. You know, soybeans are the best, the best non animal food and, you know, the rice proteins and the, and the, you know, what a bean proteins the and the, uh, um, nut proteins, they're all pretty low. doesn't mean they're not good, but but you should, if you're doing the diet that way, you should be on plenty of perfect amino. And what I'd suggest is get your blood tested because again, everyone's different. And, and, and usually what we see is within three to six months of taking good doses of amino acids, man, the, 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 the levels come up and I've seen it in, in, in patients too. You know, you get, you get patients that are anemic and they're broken down. And you start giving them perfect amino and they start to gain weight. You know, they start to gain weight and build lean body mass. I had, there's a story in the book. I had a mother bring her, her eight month old baby to me. The baby had been in the hospital since birth because he was born with the skin and the, and the muscle over his intestine had not closed. Oh, it's my. called gastroschisis. All the organs were open at birth. Oh. Now, so they took an emergency surgery. They had to pull it all tight together and sew it up, but it was so tight because the intestines were had so much pressure on them that they couldn't, they couldn't, they, they didn't work. And so they had to feed the baby intravenously for the first eight months. And they were giving him an IV protein, which caused the baby to get hepatitis. Then they couldn't give him that protein anymore because the kid was yellower than a than a banana when I first saw him. He, he, his liver was failing. And so she'd heard about Perfect Amino and she brought him up to see me. And I, in my prior life, I was a pediatrician, so I saw the kid. So he's eight months old and he weighs eight pounds, which is what his birth weight was. Oh okay? He's really, like, hadn't grown at all. So I had her give him one half of a tablet three times a day, crushed up with a little honey, because he wasn't permitted to take much by mouth. And that kid started to add one pound per week of body weight. Oh my and gosh. by two years old, he was completely normal. Wow. Stuff is, is real. It's powerful. One, a half a tablet is a half a gram of amino acids. And, you know, for a kid, it's, a, it's, it's 0.4 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. That's what they need to replace all their protein. And so he was taking uh, one and a half tablets a day. And he grew, he grew beautifully. That's amazing. So, yeah, the stuff works. That's great. I'm excited to see, um, cause you shook your head earlier when I said I was taking five grams a day earlier and I said I uh, was having trouble recovering. So I'm going to keep doing my 20 to maybe even 30 grams a day and, and see, you know, over, I guess you said between six and eight weeks, I hopefully will start to see a difference in how quickly I, re I recover. Yeah, I think you should. And then, but measure the other stuff too. Cause I don't know what else you're missing. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to get the proper testing done. All right. Just one more question on plant-based stuff. I promise <laughs> uh, because I'm going to, I'm going to keep taking my essential aminos, but I want to just do the best I can with, with my regular diet. Um, yes. So there's some foods that supposedly have all the essential aminos that are plant-based. So potatoes are one that I'm aware of chia seeds, quinoa, and buckwheat. Now you've said that it's not just about whether or not they have all the essential aminos, but it's also the ratio. Um, but would you recommend that I take those in being a vegan just to try to get more of those since they have more essential aminos? See, it's the, see there, if the balance isn't, so you're always limited by the essential amino acid. That's the least in that thing, because that's going to limit everything else. Okay. Cause the ratio, see, it's the ratio. So, the maximum ratio you're going to get is based on the one that's got the least of it in that thing. And then everything else is going to line up similarly. And then you're going to have a lot of extra stuff that your body can't need or can't use. And then it's just going to, it's going to get rid of it. So the other thing is those foods, the amounts of, of protein in those foods is, is really very low. Okay. You know, so now you've got this combination of, not 
enough of essential amino acids and not enough even quantity of them either. So um, it can be done. And again, your gut might be able to turn these things, if there's not too much glyphosate in your gut, into essential amino acids. That's what cows do. You know, how do they do it? Well, they have bacteria that will make the things that they need. And some of us have the exact right blend. I haven't seen too many, you know, over the years, because I do these tests on every one I see, and I've seen a fair number of vegans and vegetarians. And most of them, what they complain about is they're tired, and usually their hormone levels are low. And then their amino acids, they, they just, they're like terrible. They're sent, you know, their amino acid profiles in their blood. So, I mean, if a person's committed to being a vegan, they can do it. But then they got to be like you, like, okay, I got to take enough essential amino acids. I have to wonder about iron and B12 and omega-3 fats. You know, those are the, those are the sort of the four things which are most likely to, to get someone who's, who's trying to do just a plant-based diet and, and do well. Have you, can you think of any case studies of, of your folks where they're like, okay, doc, I know you are saying that I need to do these things. I think I'm, I'm going to stay a vegan. Have you seen anybody when they've supplemented with essential aminos sort of turn their lab tests around where they're getting better results? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. So it's, it's oh, yeah. possible. Oh, I think, yeah, I think you can be a vegan and I understand the phys- philosophical part and the planet part. I get it. I'm, I'm sympathetic with it really. Right. Um, but you just gotta, you gotta be more careful. You gotta be, you know, you gotta make sure you, you should be testing. You gotta just see what for your body works so that you get a combination of the lab looks good and you feel good and you got the right. Let's see. That's good. That's good news for us. We just gotta be a little bit more careful us vegans. What, is there a, a specific lab test that you would order for a vegan just to make sure they're getting what they need? Can you share that with us? In in the United States, there's a there's a lab called Genova, G E N O V A, and they have a test which is called an ion panel. It's I O N, okay. and ion stands for individualized optimized nutrition. Uh, it's, I'll put a link it's to about, that in the show notes for everybody. Yeah, and it's not cheap, but you get a lot of information. You get all the amino acid levels. You get a whole bunch of vitamin levels. You get all the essential fat levels. You get, it's got organic acids too. So it tells you how is your, you know, how are your different metabolic pathways working? Do you have a lot of bad gut bacteria that are making toxins? How are your detoxification pathways? Gives you a whole bunch of stuff, which is really good. And I I order that on everybody I see because it really makes a difference. And then you can say, Hey, look, your potassium's low, your selenium's low, your zinc is low, and you got no amino acids. And then you can, you know, you can put together a program for someone so that you can say, okay, let's supplement these for the next three months. Let's redo the test. Let's see where you are, see how you feel. Uh, and the other one is I would do a there's a there's a whole bunch of different ones, but a a test where you can look at someone's stool and get an idea of what's going on in there. Mm-hmm. You know, do they have parasites or funguses or bad bacteria? And, and that makes a big difference too, because then you get, you know, are they, are, 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 you know, they have the right mix. And that, the, a lot of those tests also will tell you, do you have enough pancreatic enzymes so that you can even digest your protein? You know, is there a lot of inflammatory markers in your intestine where you've got infection actually on a low grade level going on in there? So not so only those, getting these tests, but also working with a doc that understands how to read them and, and help you with getting help. things in the right direction. Right. Okay. Right. And there's guys, you know, some of them are medical doctors. Some of them are chiropractors or nature paths. Like Ben's a health coach. He doesn't have a health degree, but he studied this stuff. And I know he works with people. He says, get these tests, you know, take these supplements. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a whole bunch of guys that, that have assimilated this information and they, they they have businesses, they help people. And they, I, I'd recommend it. If you're, if you're trying to up your performance, they, they can really help you. Excellent. Wait, yeah. I want to ask actually about the, uh, the enzymes in the pancreas you were just, just mentioning and, and checking for in the stool test. In the book, you talked about this sort of scary catch-22 that people could get stuck in where they're not getting enough amino acids, which we, we talked earlier about. It sounds like it happens to a lot of people because um, yep. they're not getting enough essential amino acids. So they, they're not getting enough to make this, this uh, enzyme. I think it's called chymotrypsin. 
Um, and so they've got low chymotrypsin. And then if you have low chymotrypsin, you can't digest protein. So it's this bad sort of negative feedback cycle that they get stuck in, right? Right, right. So, so you gotta, you gotta fix it from the point of view of getting more, there's more than, there's more than chymotrypsin. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them, but, but in the test in the stool test I do, they give me a measurement of chymotrypsin. So it should be like 25 to 30. And I saw two people today, their, their levels were four. Mm. I could say, look, you're, you're not digesting your proteins. And then I look at their serum amino acids and you've got, you know, seven out of eight essential amino acids are in a very, very low range. And so you can say, okay, you know, how do you get out of this catch 22? Well, the way you get out of it is you got to supplement essential amino acids and you have to take digestive enzymes so that you're going to start to now break down the food that you're eating until your body can then, the body may be able to come back and then make chymotrypsin once it's got enough essential amino acids. Wow. And then maybe you don't have to take the oral enzymes. We don't know, but, but then at least you can sort of break, break out of it and move the thing forward. Otherwise, you're stuck in it. Makes sense. And stop taking the 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 drugs to block your stomach oh. acid. And if you know, and if pizza gives you heartburn, stop eating pizza. <laughs> exactly. Because your body is talking to you. You know. Yeah, it's <laughs> trying to tell you. I, I cannot digest this. Please don't. Uh, right. I think it's interesting how you know we talked about house earlier and how you're the, the, the real life house with your diagnostic testing it's so cool one thing you said in your book i thought was super interesting you know you see patients that they're sensitive to chemicals and molds and pollens and they're all protein malnourished everybody that you see that has cancer is protein malnourished um you said with your chronically ill patients you specifically you you try to fix deficiencies before you try to remove the toxins. I thought that was really interesting and I didn't really understand why. So I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about why you do it in that order. Well, see, if you give things to try to get toxins out, usually there's some sort of a binder and it will grab the toxin. It'll grab the toxin and it will then the body will try to get rid of it. But if you don't have detox pathways open, you know, if your liver is already overloaded with too many things, and let's say you give someone the the person has too much lead in their body, and that's part of the problem. And so you give them and you give them something to start grabbing lead and and pulling it out of the body. So lead is in the bones and it's in the muscles and it's in the tissues. And the body has done its best job to put it places where it's not it's going to do the least damage because it's a toxin. Right. Now, so you grab that lead, and now that lead goes to the liver, and the liver basically says. I am up to here and more. I can't handle any lead right now. You are going to go around again because I can't take you and put you take pull you out and put you in the bile. Now you've got circulating lead. Now what if the, what if it drops off in the brain? I had a lady who was she was one of the top real estate brokers in our area who went to a doctor because of fatigue and he checked her out and he said you're lead toxic. Okay, what do I do? Well, I'm going to give you IV chelation, which is a, a, a therapy where you give a, it's a pharmaceutical to grab lead and to make you pee it out. And he did that. And she, that chelator bound all the lead that was free floating in her body. And her body was too overloaded to get rid of the lead through her kidney and it ended up in her brain. And she became a, a living bag lady, honest to goodness, carrying two paper bags. She used to come in with earphones, listening to religious music, didn't really know where she was. It was a disaster. Took three years to get that unwound oh, to be gosh. able to get her handled. So if you're mineral deficient, if you're hormone deficient, you know, your thyroid's too low, your testosterone's too low, you, you're low in amino acids, you don't have magnesium and potassium and zinc and selenium, and you try to detox these people, there's a good chance you're going to make them worse or they're going to get sick and they're going to decide they don't want to do it. So you have to get them functional before you can try to get them to really like handle this stuff that, 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 that's sort of at bay right now. That Otherwise is, you get, that's so scary. And it's so important because like detox is super trendy and it has been for years now for a decade, probably. 
Um, right. So people take stuff like activative charcoal to get rid of metal toxins or whatever, which is presumably a good thing. But to your point, like if they, if they can't get their deficiencies fixed first, they could be making their problem a lot worse. So they really should get tested and see a doctor who knows how to read the results and make sure they're not deficient in things before they try to detox. It sounds like it's the best if they do it that way. Things like charcoal can sometimes, you know, they're not absorbing the charcoal. It's sort of grabbing stuff in their gut. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to make people like don't do anything, but I think that th these are sort of the principles. And then you have to see. So if you're doing X, Y, Z's detox, that you go real light, you just kind of see, have to see how you go. Right. You know, if you're getting like, uh, then you're going too fast. Right. Slow down. Back off. Yeah. Absolutely. Regroup, get tested, get some help. Speaking of, yeah, speaking of detoxing, um, I am one of those people that uh, has a glass of wine or two at the end of the day to unwind. And I was, I was alarmed when I read in your book um, cause I was all happy about my getting my polyphenols. But then you said um, that smoking and which I don't smoke, but alcohol is another thing. If you consume or it, it can consume amino acids while it's detoxing. So if I have my couple of glasses of red wine, those 20 grams or 30 grams of amino acids that I've been taking um, per your suggestion, I'm wasting some of those on detoxing my wine. So it doesn't sound like it's super efficient for me to drink alcohol at night, right? Well, or am I here's exaggerating? A, here's, here's, well, you know, I think you sort of have to pick your poisons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, I think it's there. There's pleasure and there's pain, and if one, if a little wine gives you pleasure, probably you know four ounces of wine is 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 actually fine. Okay, is it poisonous? For sure, it's alcohol. It's a tissue poison. Okay, we put specimens in alcohol when we want to kill them and preserve them. All right. If you give anybody who comes from they came from Mars, they never drank any wine before, and you give them a glass of wine or a glass of brandy or a shot of vodka or a glass of beer, they're going to be like, are you kidding me? Right. I mean, remember the first time you tried it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Or like, like a cigarette, like you got to really work at it to make it, <laughs> to get to the point where it's pleasure and it tastes good. Right. Okay, fine. You got there. I think, you know, it's all, it's dose, it's dose and it's dose of that versus dose of you walk on your lawn barefoot and the lawn guy just sprayed pesticides on there. Mm -hmm. And you just had some Wonder Bread and there's GMOs, wheat and glyphosate in the thing. And all your vitamins are packaged in, you know, in plastic bags. And you drink water bottles all day that sit in your trunk after your workout and it's been hot. And you get a headache and you take some Tylenol and your doctor's got you on a statin drug because your cholesterol too high. You know, you start to look at this. We have... I think the average person has like 3,000 exposures a day to toxins. Oh my gosh. So my idea is, you know, pick the pick the ones that really work for you, but then be as careful as you can about the rest of them. Um, and and don't and don't be crazy about it because you can get so paranoid that you don't do anything and then life's no. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Thank you for allowing me to have a little bit of wine, Doc. <laughs> yes. Well, what do you think about uh, cannabidiol? It's really big right now, uh, exploding worldwide. Um, people are using that as sort of a substitute. Um, does it have a toxic effect on the body that you're aware of? Do you know of any studies of whether or not cannabidiol uses amino acids to, to detoxify if, if necessary? I, I think it's a really slippery slope. Mm. You know, I, um, I grew up in the 60s and I did my share, okay? <laughs> Um, but I realized at one point in 1969 that, you know, this wasn't the way I was going to get spiritual enlightenment. It was a drug and it was poisoning my brain. And so I decided at that point, I'm not doing that stuff anymore. Okay. And, you know, the marijuana and the hashish back then was like probably 10% of the potency that it is now. Right. I think these are, I, and I think that there are medical uses for these products. OK, so I have cancer patients and and they are very, very ill and they it can help them. You know, some of them have some anti cancer properties. Some of them help nausea. Some of them help appetite. Some of them help pain. But they're getting it as as a, it's a drug and it can be helpful. I think the legalization of all this stuff 
and it's available anywhere and anyone can get it. I think, I, I think that the powers that be are trying to create a society where people are controllable and they can get what they want out of you. And when you lose your mind to a chemical, you are not yourself and you don't make right decisions. And it's no, and you can never get spiritually enlightened by thinking a drug is going to get you there. It's the most bogus thing that ever existed. And if you talk to a, a self-respecting monk or yogi or someone who spent their life looking for mental awareness and clarity, and then you give someone a drug, you take that away. Because now it's not under their power. See, the idea is that it's you, and you are the cause point of the universe. You are creating the universe. And now you are giving it over to a drug, and you are nothing but just the effect of some chemical. And I think that is really, I think people are, are, are doing the wrong thing. And, they're, and it isn't smart. And, you know, medical uses, I get it. I even, you know, I do, I use it with people, but for, for recreation, I think it's dangerous. And I think that, that, you know, kids that start it young, they have, they can't think, they don't produce, they have trouble and they're addicted and it's a drug and then they go to other drugs. So I'm, I'm really anti-drug because I think it's, it's what's killing our society It's more and more drugs. You go to Colorado, you see traffic accidents, crime you know, it's not better. It's always worse. So I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm really anti-drug. I, and so in our practice, you know, unless it's a true emergency, we never use drugs. We try to use things that are going to enhance the body's ability to, to be healthy and take care of itself. That's a really interesting take on it, Dr. Minkoff, because, you know, if you look at a lot of people look at wellness balance, which is what I try to teach on the show is finding wellness balance. And so, yeah. you know, you've got, depending on who you talk to, seven or eight different dimensions of wellness, social, emotional, environmental, spiritual is one of the pillars of wellness. And so yeah. that's an interesting take on it where you could never be spiritually whole or spiritually wholly well, unless you're doing it from within. So the example that just came to mind as you were talking was, I'm using my couple of glasses of red wine to unwind or had been thinking about CBD instead but maybe I should just try to do meditation and be more spiritual about attacking my calm versus uh, using a drug. That's a really uh, it was eye opening. That's a good good point. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you <laughs> thank know, you. we're spiritual beings, right? We're immortal spiritual beings, and what is true of you is that you're you're that you're that thing that's aware of being aware, and anything which degrades that, which is what all drugs do, always is now you've moved away. Right. You've moved away. So. Yeah, to your point, the, I, I think, the monks probably don't uh, really care about what the studies on CBD say. They probably just like, no, we'll just, uh, you know, be like water and meditate and we're just fine. Right. And there's, you know, it's, it's all about awareness. It's about awareness. And then the, the more you're aware, the more you can be responsible for all the stuff that's going on. And then that gives you an ability to be able to do something about it. Right. Because the, the thing is going down. You know, the whole society is going down. And a lot of what's taking it down is people on drugs, you know, and and they don't they, they don't they, they don't they can't do it. They can't confront it. See, something happens in your life and it's tough. If you take a drug, you lost. Okay. Right. Yeah. Now, if you've got stage four cancer and you're dying in pain, I will give you morphine for sure. But right. those are very extreme edges where then it's used medically. Right. But, you know, you look at the kid and he's got he's jittery and he's got ADD. What do they do? They give him amphetamines. Oh, it's terrible. It's right? terrible. They give him amphetamines. It's terrible. Yeah. And what that kid needs is not eat his crappy cereal in the morning and give him some, you know, some omega-3 fats and get him get him off the food that he's allergic to and find out all the words he's gone by in his studies that he doesn't really understand. And you'll turn that kid right into a Einstein or somebody else. Right. Because a lot of those kids are super smart and they need a teacher that's got 50 more IQ points so that they can actually handle that kid instead of saying, you know, they send him to the school counselor and the school counselor says, oh, your kid can't come back in school until he's on medication. Hmm. It's just, that's you know, terrible. 
terrible. All right, I've taken up a ton of your time, Dr. Minkoff. Okay. I really appreciate it. I just have a couple of questions if I if, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so we talked about how essential aminos can be great if you're in ketosis. Um, so a lot of times I'll take my aminos before I go for a bike ride first thing in the morning fasted. It's great. It actually helps me calm my stomach and gives me energy. And of course, I'm not tapping into muscle. And as you mentioned, um, you're staying ketogenic. So super cool. Right. Um, but I also occasionally do a prolonged fast of 24 hours. And I was wondering if you're aware of any studies on uh, essential amino acid usage during a prolonged fast. You know, one of the main things, it's not necessarily for short term gains. I do prolonged fast for all of the great autophagy benefits that you have with the cell turnover and stuff like that. Are you aware of right. whether or not essential aminos will slow down the rate of autophagy or is there any studies on that? I don't know. You know, the, the amino acids are part of the triggers for mTOR. Mm -hmm. So if mTOR is on, mTOR is the, is the sort of anti-autophagy. It's the, it's the builder. Okay. So I think if someone wants maximum autophagy, uh, probably they shouldn't take amino acids during those 24 hours. I, I don't know, and I haven't seen it studied. This is sort of theoretical. I just had one of my employees do a 10 day water fast oh. with five. She took five grams. She took one scoop of perfect amino four times a day during the 10 days. She had a very good experience and better than when she just did water. Now, did she autophagize less than she would have if it would just been water. I don't know. I know you detox better when you're taking aminos. So maybe your clearance is better. Mm -hmm. This is very hard to study because these genes of what gets turned on and what gets turned off are very hard to measure unless you have really sophisticated lab stuff. Mm -hmm. And I don't know anybody that's doing it. So I don't really know. Um, and I tend to take them on the days that I do fast but I don't know if I'm compromising my autophagy or not. Right. I mean, yes. there's no question. I, I would certainly feel better. I, I mean, you, you can tangibly feel the additional energy, the, as you mentioned too, like the, sh the mental sharpness, the acuity is certainly enhanced when you take essentials. So it would be great if it doesn't bother it. We should, uh, right. we should get a study going on that. That'd be awesome. <laughs> okay. Uh, last question. It's the question I ask everybody that comes on my show, Dr. Minkoff. So, I talked about how the show is about wellness balance and, you know, thinking of the, you know, different dimensions of wellness, occupational, spiritual, social, emotional, intellectual, talk about any one of them, all of them. How do you find your balance on a daily basis? Well, I'm a, I'm a, a type A high achiever. So I'm trying to do all of them all at the same time. I'm not okay? surprised it's by just, that. <laughs> just always been the way I am. So, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a little graph I keep on myself uh, when I go to bed at night and I look at all my sort of dynamics, you know, my body, my education, my, my spiritual development. And then I've got, you know, I've got a sort of an expanded circle of my kids and my grandkids and my wife and then my businesses and, you know, and mankind, you know, as you expand these circles, you get, you get sort of bigger and bigger chunks. And so I'm trying to look at each day did I, did I, how did I handle that area? You know, did I, did I tell my wife she cooked me a great dinner and give her a hug and tell her I love her, you know, and I can check that off at night. Did, did I, uh, did I eat bad that day? And then I sort of log my food and it's like, oh geez, I've got to do that better tomorrow. So it gives me sort of a way to keep my own balance and my goals in mind so that I can sort of try to keep track of everything. Oh, that my brother, geez, I haven't called him in a, in like 10 days. I wonder how he's doing. And then the next, I'll put a little note and think like, I'm going to call, call him tomorrow and say, you know, hi, how you doing? And just things like that. So I can, you know, I think that as people get better, if they stay on the, you know, there's sort of this curve. If you look at the old yogi literature, create, survive, destroy. Okay. Everything go, you were born, you live, you die. That if you can keep your life, no matter what your age is, on the create side of the equation, which is more, better, longer, bigger, and keep it in mind that you are doing this yourself and it isn't being imposed on you, that you could have a very full life for a long time and achieve the purposes for which you are here or that you decide that you make 
of why you're here and you can just have a ball. And I'm having more fun now in my life than I've ever had. And I've got more balls in the air and it's the most fun. That's fantastic advice. I love that advice. So, you know, you, a lot of folks do the uh, gratitude journaling first thing in the day and, and sort of set up their day in a positive light, which is fantastic. It's been shown to improve uh, your uh, overall wellness, I think, by like 5%. It's pretty amazing. But to check back in with yourself at the end of the day and sort of be realistic about what you accomplished and and to be thoughtful and have foresight on what you could do better maybe even the next day or even congratulate yourself for what you accomplished that day is that's really smart. I like that. Thank you for sharing. Good. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, I've kept you for over an hour and a half, Dr. Minkoff. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today. And hopefully we'll get to chat again soon. I, I still had even more questions to ask you, but I, I'll have to get to them next time, hopefully. Sounds good. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And uh, all the best to everything you're doing. It's really, it's well done. Thank you all very much for watching the show today. Also, thank you to my special guest, Dr. David Minkoff, for joining the show and sharing all of his wonderful expertise. If you like the show, please give it a like right down here. And if you haven't already subscribed to the Boost Health TV YouTube channel, you can do so right up here so you can keep up with all the latest and greatest. Until next time, this is Paul Sandberg for Dr. David Minkoff saying goodbye and find your balance.